I think you have to agree. <laughs> okay, cool, fantastic. Welcome everybody. Welcome Vladimir Belogolovsky, who is based in New York City. Um, we have today, of course, Vladimir giving an amazing talk. He's a world leading expert on Chinese architecture. He's published several books on it. And before we come to introduce him, I just want to uh, mention that on Tuesday, 18th of October, we have, of course, Professor Michael Hensel from the TU Vienna in Austria talking to us about changing practice. And on Friday, 21st of October, we have Perkins Will, uh, Director's Head of Research in Los Angeles, um, talking to us on the impact of research on design. So very exciting times. And on Monday, um, today's Friday, on Monday, we are back in the studio for in-person desk crits for the downtown Las Vegas project developing individual schematic design of each student because there is a review on the 31st of October, as you are aware. So, and today, later on at 2.30, we have the precedent analysis presentations of the students. But now coming to the most exciting part, uh, which is uh, Vladimir's uh, presentation. Vladimir is an American curator and critic based in New York City, and he studied engineering in Ukraine, I believe in Odessa, right? Yes and architecture in New York City, where he graduated from the Cuba Union School of Architecture in 1996. His New York-based curatorial project, a nonprofit, focuses on curating and designing exhibitions worldwide. Belogolovsky writes for Architecture Viva in Madrid, Azura in Toronto, and is a columnist, which means he writes regular, on Arch Daily and Stir magazine. He has interviewed more than 400 leading international architects, and apart from China Dialogues, he has written 15 books and lectured in more than 30 countries. In 2018, Belogolovsky taught design studio at Tsinghua University in Beijing as a visiting scholar, which is one of the best uh, architecture schools in China. And his recent book, recently published book entitled China Dialogues, published by Oro Editions and Ponji University Press this year, is an anthology of 21 insightful conversations selected by Vladimir from his huge archive of interviews conducted with leading Chinese architects during his extensive travels in China. Since the mid 1990s, when China allowed its architects to practice independently from government run design institutes, until, until then, you did not have private practices. So 1995, this changed. A new kind of architecture distinguished by unique regional characteristics has emerged. China Dialogues opens up the thinking process of the country's top architects as they share their ideas, insightful intentions and visions in unusual, unusually revealing and candid ways. So we're looking forward to hear all these candid stories. <laughs> and of course, China is a huge country, immensely with 1.4 billion people. It has very strong regional differences. So everywhere you go, you know, if you're in Shanghai, people do one thing. But if you go to Chengdu or to Dalian or to Harbin, it's completely different. And the climatic conditions are so different. So very interesting to hear about that. And a very warm welcome to our uh, guests today and especially now to Vladimir Belogolovsky. Um, over to you, Vladimir. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. So maybe uh, I can share the screen now, uh, just to to start. Um, I okay. This should be. No. Let me see. Can you hear the the slide? We can see. I mean, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah. We can hear you. We can see the slides. You can hear and you can see me. Okay, very yes. good. Thank you. So uh, let me first uh, just uh, show you a couple of things before starting the lecture, just to show you uh, how I fit into uh, today's topic and uh, a little bit uh, what I do in addition to what uh, Stefan just mentioned. Um, I would say that my primary project is uh, interviewing architects, tracing what is going on um, in, in the profession on a very individual basis. I, I go after architects uh, very chaotically and non-chronologically, but sometimes I focus on specific regions. And uh, so today we'll talk about a whole 
uh, number of uh, uh, discoveries that I uh, made in, in China by uh, confronting architects uh, very much in person. Um, so um, I started interviewing architects in 2002, so it's been 20 years, and uh, I've done a number of books and lectures, but in 2016, I started doing this um, um, installations, uh, which are uh, kind of, uh, you know, a little bit artistic, a little bit conceptual installations based on recordings and uh, quotes and even transcripts. You go inside, you can uh, actually um, familiarize with uh, very detailed conversations um, with various architects. So this took place a few times. Uh, there is another um, exhibition coming in India in March. Um, there was one that I did in Shanghai uh, based on 10 conversations, five with uh, some of the leading American architects and some of the leading Chinese architects. And it's always interesting to juxtapose uh, this uh, voices and uh, individual approaches to see, um, you know, what makes them in common. And uh, of course, there are some books where I try to disseminate these conversations. And uh, so China Dialogues is one of them. I've done other books, but these are the, uh, these are the books that are uh, specifically related to, oh, all of them are related to conversations. So they are, um, uh, conversations with uh, different kinds of uh, architects. And let me just go ahead and uh, start. Um, so this is based on my uh, latest book, China Dialogues. Um, so it's right here. Um, it would not be very modest of me to encourage you to uh, get the book, but anyway, why not? It's um, it's an interesting uh, compilation of a collection uh, anthology of uh, um, really the leading leading currently uh, practicing architects in in China. So there are twenty one interviews. Um, I took, I recorded these interviews over the course of about three and a half years. And I would say that right now there are probably, uh, there are quite a few, there are probably 30 to 40 architects who really, uh, um, you know, uh, deserve our attention. This, uh, I would say, these are architects who are practicing on a world-class level. Um, the ones that I put together in this collection, I would say that they are, uh, they really constitute a kind of leadership in uh, architectural discourse in, in China. And uh, so we have all the leading architects who were born in the, in the 1960s, uh, the most active generation of architects, who, those who were born in, in the 1970s. And there is one architect who was born already in early 1980s and also is uh, quite active. Um, Stefan said that I, you know, it's, it's uh, my focus, China. Uh, it is true, uh, partially. Um, I would say that my focus changes uh, because um, you know it kind of shifts, and you can see that uh, geographically there is a, there is a shift going on every few years in in architecture. You can see how um, we talked about uh, Japan, how we talked about the Netherlands and Spain and Colombia very recently, and how um, this conversation kind of shifts and now. Uh, I would say there is a lot of talk about China, and I would also suggest that uh, there is uh, more and more conversations are happening in regards to what's going on in India. Uh, and this is one of those countries where, for example, the climate change is uh, felt probably the most uh, already. 
and uh, I I'm very curious to what is uh, going to happen to, um, for example, architecture in Ukraine um, in a few years. That's also going to be very interesting. So right now, yes, I, I'm focused on uh, China, and I would select probably uh, four main reasons uh, why. So one reason is, is that China constitutes a kind of microcosm uh, of a global situation in architecture. And um, if the latest, most relevant topics are about uh, integration uh, between architecture and nature uh, and rediscovering the countryside, that then definitely China uh, deserves uh, our attention because this is where most of the projects uh, are happening in the countryside. And, and of course, uh, this is what's happening all over the world. Our focus is, is shifting also, not geographically, but also locally uh, from urban places to what is happening outside of the cities. Uh, the second reason is that no other country has made such a striking leap uh, professionally achieving a highly uh, distinctive uh, identity. You can really recognize uh, these projects. Yes, can, uh, China is very diverse. It's very di diverse uh, uh, culturally, climatically, and in many other ways, but nevertheless, it is China and you can recognize um, the uh, Chinese uh, context and Chinese identity already. And it's very interesting that uh, China is one of the few countries where uh, uh, the, the local, the um, regional character is, is recognized. Um, in another reason is that, or part of this is that uh, private practice was allowed only recently in, in mid nineties. Uh, so that led to a complete uh, shift change in how architecture is done in the country. Uh, another reason, third reason is that uh, truly uh, modern contemporary architecture started in late nineties really not even late 90s, but early 2000s or year 2000 is actually very um, momentum, momentous uh, year. Um, so which, which means that all of these changes are very recent, extremely recent. Uh, so that also means that all of these architects who are the pioneers of uh, new architecture in China, they're still around, they are, um, practicing today, uh, all of them are relatively, you know, the oldest, the oldest were born in late 1950s. So all of them are still around. You can talk to them, ask questions. And this is a very unusual situation around the world because this kind of changes, um, you know, introduction of modern project uh, happened in other countries a hundred years ago. So this is a very unique situation because in the entire 20th century, I would argue um, no real masterpieces, non um, kind of um, derivative projects were built in, in China. And, um, and we're gonna talk about this in detail. And, and then uh, the fourth reason uh, why China deserves this attention is that uh, it discovered the countryside, I already mentioned that, and um, that's a kind of alternative uh, to global architecture. So in a way, cities have become interchangeable, the situations in cities become interchangeable. Uh, architecture is very similar in, in cities globally, but every time you go to, to the countryside, to a village, it has a culture on its own, and it has its own uh, strong identities. So this is where a lot of architects are now kind of uh, trying to rejuvenate, um, you know, the discourse and find, uh, you know, find work to kind of bring new ideas into, especially now when um, authorship 
is no longer um, the mainstream of architecture. So, the, the, so you need to look for new ideas all the time and uh, uh, countryside is one of the places. Uh, as we go over different projects, we, uh, I would suggest to pay attention to uh, kind of keep uh, on, the, on the back of your mind these two metaphors. Uh, even without flowers and trees, and trees, it would still make a garden. It's a quote by Ton Jun, uh, very early, one of the first um, modern architects in, in China. Uh, he was the, uh, the professor uh, of Wan Shu, who said the second quote, uh, to me, any type of architecture, no matter what is its function, is a house, and I would add, no matter not only what its function, but also uh, what's the scale, you can see many of these projects in a way like uh, a house. A house is always this metaphor. A house is one and um, a garden is the second one. And when I say a garden, what I mean is that a garden is a kind of system of fragments and plants or all plants, and so as they die out, new plants are planted. And this is how many of these architectural projects, in fact, are built. Okay. Um, actually, I'm trying to, let me see. I'm trying to go to the next slide and for some reason, it's not I, working. You might have to click on it and then go and move it. Sometimes it's stuck on your computer. Let me see. Because it worked before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just redo this. No. Yes. Okay. It's moving. Okay. So this is not the kind of architecture we're going to be talking about today, but I just want to start to give you, um, and of course you all know this, but I just want to um, have it as a, as a context, uh, 2008. And you can see that some of these projects were built around that time for, for obviously for, for the Beijing Olympics. 2008 became uh, the moment when China uh, finally ascended onto the world stage. Uh, it was architecture that gave its many uh, achievements a, a kind of uh, tangible, tangible substance. Uh, Beijing Olympics, uh, then Expo in, in Shanghai in 2010. Uh, so all of these projects gave a chance to many uh, of the architects. And, and now I have to stress foreign architects. So you can see that all of these projects were done by foreign architects and uh, more, more to the point, uh, uh, star architects. Um, but also, uh, you know, there were many ambitious projects, uh, main, mostly urban projects, one ambition project after another uh, that encouraged hundreds of millions of Chinese to relocate from sleepy villages to roaring cities. And uh, China, uh, in a way, or Chinese cities turned into a kind of playground for uh, star architects. Yet, uh, you, can see, you can see how little this uh, very abstract, egocentric projects have to do with the place, with the local culture. Um, and history. So uh, these buildings are uh, about, uh, they are about expressing very individual, individualistic um, uh, ideas. Um, and um, what's interesting is that, what's interesting is, is that in the, in the background, in the shadow of all these projects, uh, the, uh, since 2000s, a new generation of architects, local architects uh, was, uh, came, came 
you can say came of age, right? And um, starts in working on a very com on completely different kind of uh, projects, different kind of architecture. And I would argue that the work they are doing now and uh, for the last maybe 10, uh, 15 years, a little bit more, is I would say really the most interesting work uh, that's happening in, in China, most relevant, most thoughtful, and even most original. And um, until recently, many of these buildings uh, remained uh, in a way invisible. It was uh, at the 16th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale, which was just recently, just three years ago, four years ago, in 2018, that uh, the profession uh, suddenly, suddenly was confronted with so many uh, projects, not just ideas, but built work on, on, a, on a great scale and uh, in great quantities and uh, really all over the country. Uh, Li Shan Nin, who is now a professor and dean at uh, Tanjay University in Shanghai, he was the curator of this exhibition. It was called Building a Future Countryside. There were about 60 projects put together in this uh, Chinese pavilion, which is a large pavilion in uh, Arsenale. And um, what's interesting is the contrast, the contrast between the Chinese pavilion and all other, many other pavilions in, in that year in Venice. Um, you might remember this was the year when uh, Switzerland was given the gold, uh, golden line. Uh, this was the year when uh, the British Pavilion decided not to show any work. So in a way it was kind of hijacked by the curators and they decided to just leave the pavilion entirely empty. They even left walls, all the walls in the pavilion unpainted. They put some chairs in the middle and they asked architects and curators to just discuss not projects, but issues. And it, it was funny to see, to walk around uh, Venice and see um, or hear a lot of ideas and a lot of issues being discussed. But if you would be, if you, if you would go to the Chinese pavilion, you would see a lot of work already uh, built. Uh, so that was very impressive. Uh, so China uh, celebrated its relentless progress uh, by building highly original architecture uh, all over the country, as I mentioned. And uh, the cumulative work they produced since the turn of the century uh, can now be identified as, uh, in a way, distinctly Chinese, not vernacular, but uncompromisingly rooted in modern traditions. And just to mention, I, I will show a couple of few, a couple of more reference uh, slides before we go into, into the work. Uh, so this is the architect who, on the right, the architect who is referred to as uh, the father of modern Chinese architecture is Lian Sichen. He is the exact contemporary of Louis Kahn, who was born in, in 1901, uh, died in 72. And his wife, Lin, uh, Lin Huiyin, uh, or Phyllis Lin, um, she is considered to be the first modern uh, woman architect, female architect in modern China. Uh, both were trained in the University of uh, Pennsylvania. They belong to the first generation of uh, uh, Chinese architects. Uh, there were no architects in China really uh, before. They were all started to be trained in the US in the 1920s. And um, at the same time, you can't really call him a, a so-called Le Corbusier of China because his uh, focus one was on preservation, not on developing a new language for, for Chinese architecture. And uh, he was the author of uh, Chinese architecture, a pictorial history. This was really um, intended for Western audience. It was uh, written in English. Lian uh, rediscovered and systematized uh, so-called grammar of uh, Chinese architecture. 
uh, meaning uh, mainly traditional architecture. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is that uh, he was not a modernist in European sense. There was uh, uh, no really break from, from history. And um, let me just touch a little bit on the 20th century architecture in China. On the left, you can see uh, really what is called the first modern building in China, uh, San Yat-sen Mausoleum in Nanjing uh, from 1921, uh, sorry, 29 uh, by Lu Yanzi. So uh, this is considered to be the first practice in modern China. And uh, on the right, you see the Bund in Shanghai. It's a kind of showcase of various architectural uh, fashions in a variety of European styles. Again, it, these are very derivative projects um, from Renaissance and Baroque revival to Bazaar and uh, Art Deco. So in a way, these were two different directions. One was a hybrid model uh, where there is a hybrid between modern and historical uh, architecture kind of fused together. And then there was um, uh, just following historicist, different historicist uh, styles. Um, so there was no attempt to express a kind of individual identity at that point. Uh, this is another example. Uh, this is uh, this are some of the projects from uh, Tsinghua University uh, campus, and on that campus you can actually find this kind of samplings from different periods of uh, architecture, and you can see uh, all of these projects are very derivative, and they followed uh, different models that were in a way kind of popular at that. Time so you see Neo-Palladian, Jeffersonian model, uh, social uh, uh, Soviet social realism, uh, and and a few others. And uh, so all of this were quite derivative uh, projects throughout the 1900s. And um, another high point is a collection of ten great buildings from 1959. So all of them were designed in 1959 and all of them were built in 1959. All of them were, uh, were done in Beijing. And so all of them were built uh, to commemorate the 10 years anniversary of the uh, founding of the People's Republic of China. So on the left, you see National Museum of China uh, on Tiananmen Square. Uh, this building was recently uh, uh, rebuilt, uh, not rebuilt, uh, remodeled, um, by GMP, a German firm. So this is formerly a tw twin museums, the Museum of Chinese Revolution and National uh, Museum of Chinese History. And uh, this project was done by uh, uh, Zhang Kaiji, who is uh, Yun Ho Chang's father. And we will talk about Yun Ho Chang in, in a second. And um, on the right, you see Beijing train station. So all of these buildings were modeled on uh, Soviet socialist realism style. And this is uh, another project by uh, Jean Kaiji, who again, uh, father of Yun Fu Chen, who we'll be talking about uh, shortly. And uh, so this is a government, it's a very typical government uh, building um, in, in Beijing. Uh, again, it's a kind of hybrid model. You can see how uh, the Chinese roof was always, always uh, could not be abandoned. This building is from 1955. Um, so, um, and this were buildings done by um, uh, local design. Uh, so this particular one, local design institute in, in Beijing. And uh, the building recalls uh, an enlarged kind of section of the Great Wall, uh, Great Wall of China. Um, so, in a way, you can say that there was no attempt to uh, bring modern mo modern um, architecture into China, uh, not the hybrid model, but uh, kind of non-compromising, uncompromising version of modernism. So it's interesting that when the country was opened by Deng Xiaoping, 
1978, um, IMP was invited to, to come to Beijing and to build a modern project. And uh, what's interesting is that um, what could become the first really modern building in China, uh, it was uh, an opportunity lost. Originally, he was asked to do a high rise in the center of Beijing, and he decided to do um, a, a kind of mid medium rise, um, mid rise project uh, yeah, on the outskirts of Beijing kind of retreated by uh, taking a more cautionary approach. Uh, he, um, the building, the building in, in a way big has become a, a kind of, um, um, a timid kind of timid pursuit of uh, trying to marry uh, again, uh, Chinese vernacular with modern architecture. It's a hybrid model. It's a box like a modern building with a thin layer of uh, folkloric uh, decor. And again, it's topped by a, a kind of coy version of a traditional Chinese roof. Uh, so not only it has to do very little with um, modern, you know, modern work at the time, but it has very little to do even with the work of uh, IMP himself. So in a way, um, in a way, the entire 20th century uh, Chang Chinese architecture um, was uh, following this uh, kind of traditional, neo-traditional model. And um, the Chinese roof, um, you know, this version of the Chinese roof uh, employed by Pei uh, brought a kind of ambivalence, again, ambivalence to local architects, but at the same time, it reassured them that the project that I just showed before um, um, was a kind of, the, the, the architects were on the right path and they just continued the same model uh, for the next 20 years until really close to the end of the 20th century. And so this is, uh, so now we start a very kind of different chapter in Chinese architecture. Um, I will talk about um, really 10 architects. There's going to be one more who is not in the book. So really 11 architects. Um, the architect who can be called uh, really the father of compromisingly contemporary architecture is uh, Yun Fo Chen. So it, it was his father who built quite a few projects in Beijing. He was the head architect of uh, Beijing Design Institute. He worked for a while uh, personally uh, with Mao. And so he was a very accomplished architect in the country. And um, uh, Chang studied in, in the US. He became a, a prominent academic. He was one of the first uh, of his generation to go to the US, to go uh, abroad. Uh, his practice was founded in 1993. And that practice became really the first uh, private practice, private uh, architectural practice in the country. So that practice laid down uh, the foundation of uh, contemporary Chinese architecture. And uh, Chang's work is uh, quite conceptual. It's very, very different from what was uh, done there before. Uh, here you see his project. So this is a very early project before he opened his practice. So this is a competition project, um, a vertical glass house. Uh, it's an award-winning entry for 1991 Shikin uh, residential design competition by organized by Japan Architectural mm -hmm. Magazine. Uh, the project was, uh, in fact, realized. It was built many years later in 2013 in Shanghai. Uh, but curiously, it remains a, a theoretical and autonomous work because it is, uh, it is not rooted in, in the place and pragmatics of the site. It is really... Um, based on the project designed on paper, um, you know, really uh, 20, 20 years, 
20 years, more than 20 years before that. Uh, the house, in a way, is a kind of inversion of modernist glass house, uh, following such models as Farnsworth House or Glass House by Philip Johnson. It literally turns it 90 degrees by flipping the materials. Uh, solid roof and floor were replaced by glass, while entirely transparent walls were replaced by almost windowless uh, concrete walls. Uh, so it is an, a kind of inversion essentially of uh, Western model of a house into uh, internally focused Eastern model of a house. This is um, already 2002. So this is also Yun Ho Chen. Um, it's uh, his second critical project. Um, it's a villa for commune by the wall. You might remember it was a very famous uh, um, project by invitation. A number of architects from Asia, including such architects as Shigeruban and uh, Kendakuma. And um, um, Yun Ho Chang was the, uh, the Chinese architect. So there were about uh, 12, there were 12 architects who were asked to build 12 villas. And so next to the Great Wall outside of Beijing, it was eventually expanded to 40 villas some years later. And the project was initiated by Zhang Xin, uh, a, a billionaire woman and uh, a property tycoon who, who is the head of Soho China is really the largest developer in the country. And uh, what's interesting about this uh, project is that it's, um, it's called split house. Uh, so there are two halves. Um, they form a triangular courtyard between the halves. And there are nine different variations. So you can place this house in different type of, uh, typographic situations change the angle, change the positions of these halves and entirely change um, the look of it. Um, it's, um, so this is some, some of the photos. The house is also um, an environmental model. Uh, it is a biodegradable house with a uh, wooden frame and ramped earth walls. Uh, so the, the house in a way can disintegrate uh, back into nature and um, and, um, and so you can see uh, you can see nature even uh, through the glass on the right side you see the interior here so you can see nature even under your feet um, I, I like the quote by Yun Ho Cheng he said I don't think the world of architecture should be divided into east and west I want to think of it as divided into North and South, uh, climatically, not culturally. So this work is not driven by uh, the image of uh, local or regional architecture. It, and in fact, it's one of the first, and it's already 2002, one of the first buildings that does this. Uh, this is Wan Shu. Uh, this project was done a little earlier, 2000. Um, he's the founder of Amateur Architecture Studio, of course, uh, the only Chinese architect who won the Pritzker Prize, uh, which happened in 2012. Uh, and that was the year when Yun Ho Chen uh, was invited to the jury uh, of, the, uh, of the Pritzker Prize. He's, um, so Wan Shu is based in Hangzhou and was uh, really little known before uh, he was awarded the prize. This is his library uh, in uh, Denshan uh, College in Soju, Soju University. Um, this is um, one of the early projects uh, which were, some of his early projects were influenced by the constructivist uh, text and uh, projects in the West. And um, Arguably, uh, the first pure modernist. This would be. This could be considered the first pure uh, modernist project in in China. 
although in in our interviews in our interview uh, one one should emphasize that uh, he sees this project as postmodernist uh, so there are multiple references you can see, but none of them are uh, going to traditional Chinese architecture. You can see references from Aldo Rossi, Richard Meyer, Alvaro Cesar, uh, Tado Anda, um, but also traditional Chinese garden, but, but in a non a kind of explicit or literal way. And it reflects his uh, interest in deconstructivist architecture, with, which can still be felt in his kind of contorted forms, um, cavities, um, and erratically juxtaposed uh, materials, uh, even in his later projects. So this project, in a way, represents a kind of transition, what he from what he calls white period to um, his current uh, black period, where you know black, it refers to he, to the materials he is using. So he is now working with soil, stone, brick, pottery, plates, uh, tiles, etc. Um, this is a house uh, again, two thousand two, uh, and uh, this is uh, another milestone project. Um, called Father's House by uh, Chinquin Ma, it, it, his own father. Uh, this is built in the vicinity of Xi'an in, uh, again in 2002. This was a 10 year kind of um, construction project. And um, the result is, um, um, is that he, he, Ma is uh, one of the pioneering, one of the pioneering uh, architects and educator who taught in, in America and served as Dean at the University of Southern California for 10 years from 2007 to 2000 to 2017. And he founded uh, Mata Spam office. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to reach him um, I really tried. I don't know where he is. Um, he seems to be practicing now in, in China and very successful, but, um, uh, and his architecture uh, changed dramatically, but um, his, first, his first house was quite special. And here you can see some of the close-ups. Uh, this is, um, introspective um, kind of uh, structure um, is um, so this is uh, you can clearly see here um, reinforced concrete uh, structure with uh, river stone um, kind of laid in and um, with the timber shutters, uh, it's a very tight, very tight uh, composition. Um, very unusual visual, kind of very, very coherent. And what's interesting is that, again, it, th there are no references to historical archetypes, but you can, if you know the work of, uh, early work of Heretic Demeron, uh, from 1980s, uh, this house, uh, interestingly, probably uh, served as an inspiration. Here you can see a very expressed uh, concrete structure, concrete grid that purposely left uh, kind of open to uh, underline a kind of abstract notion of this structure. So, um, uh, this is an important project by Wan Shu. So this is uh, already, uh, he's in his uh, so-called black periods so of completely different architecture from what I showed you a few slides before his library. This is Ningbo History Museum built in 2008. So 2008 is a very important 
uh, year for China. This is when all the attention was on the foreign architects and uh, in primary cities, in, uh, mainly in Beijing and Shanghai, where all these eye-catching buildings were built. But here we have um, a project on a, on a similar scale, but not in the first tier city, Ningbo. Uh, we see um, a kind of uh, um, resistance kind of project, uh, a reaction to what was built um, by foreigners. So, um, the architect refers to it as a mountain. It's a very enigmatic project, a medieval kind of, the metaphor probably is uh, like a medieval medieval uh, fortress surrounded by a moat. It, it's a kind of town, a world in itself. Uh, and and uh, But the most important part is the surface. The surface of this, uh, uh, building is clad in recycled terracotta bricks and tiles in uh, seemingly random patterns, and um, they recall countless uh, demolished buildings, in fact, right here in, in this area, um, demolished buildings in, in local villages. It brings uh, aware, awareness of the issue of preservation. Um, in, in this case, in a very poetic way. And um, so not only uh, this building is a, a kind of stunning work of art, but it has a message and the message is to local developers, uh, stop demolishing our heritage. Look how beautiful it is. And um, in fact, in the last 20 years or so, more than 90% of all Chinese heritage was demolished. Uh, this is absolutely mind boggling. And there was only one attitude with new construction. First, whatever it was, uh, it had to be demolished and then the new project would start over. So this is a project which is a kind of resistance against that attitude. And um, this is uh, Shangshan, uh, Shangshan uh, campus at China Academy of Art in Guangzhou. In Hangzhou, this is where Wan Shu is the dean, and he was commissioned to design this entire campus, which is about 30 buildings. And he did it, uh, so it's his largest project. Uh, and according to him, his favorite project, it's an active uh, a kind of dialogue between the buildings and nature and uh, alternative, in a way, an alternative model. This building is also on campus. It's a guest house um, for, for this, so for this uh, school, China Academy of Art. And uh, so this is um, conference center, hotel, dining hall. It's a very labyrinthian uh, creature-like building covered by a single, multi-fold roof with an uh, idiosyncratic system of uh, uh, parasite-like uh, zigzagging walkways, ramps, bridges, stairs, uh, and, and so on. And this is another view from above, and you can see how these walkways and bridges, how they penetrate the roof and go over. Um, so this seemingly redundant wood structure um, creates a series of uh, kind of wonderfully uh, Baroque uh, situations. It's a kind of very Pyrenean, um, uh, Pyrenean spaces, uh, a walking works by such inventive uh, European architects as Carlos Carpa and Rick Mirais. Uh, this is a very emotional architecture. Um, and uh, if you think about a metaphor here, it's like being on a boat in a storm and ocean. It must be really emotional to, to visit this. And it's interesting that the whole campus was designed as a kind of pedagogical, uh, pedagogical tool for students, uh, especially the way the materials are juxtaposed and um, exemplified how they can be used. 
uh, Li Shadon is a reflexive regionalist uh, professor at Tsinghua University. He was educated in um, the Netherlands in addition to China and, and then uh, studied, uh, actually taught uh, for some years in Singapore. And um, in 2010, he became the first Chinese architect who was given uh, Aga Khan Award. Um, um, and um, what's interesting is that I, this is, this is uh, maybe a good place to mention my connection to, to China, how it really uh, started getting personal because I, I've been there many times uh, a number of, I did a number of exhibitions and some lectures. And in 2017, I was there with, a, with an exhibition and I uh, was given a student who uh, helped me to uh, mount a, a show. And I just asked the student if he could introduce me to one of his professors who would be interviewed. And uh, so he introduced me to Lisha Adon, who I knew nothing about before. And um, that interview led to another meeting, another meeting. And he, during one of the conversations, he just uh, interrupted whatever I was saying and said, uh, would you like to, to teach here? And, um, and he wanted my answer right away. Uh, he said, uh, well, yes or no. Uh, anyway, I never taught at that point um, in my life. So I told him and he said, well, there is always the first time. So he invited me to teach. And this is, this is really how this whole project started. I, uh, in 2018, I spent about four months in China on campus. And that led to meeting many more architects uh, travel in the country, visiting many of these projects. And this is how the book came. And um, um, he, talks, uh, he talks a lot about authorship. He actually said, we need to be more confident about our culture collectively before we can pursue our ideas individually. And um, what's interesting about this building is that um, it is on the outskirts of Beijing. Uh, this is the area where there are lots of these uh, twigs that locals use for uh, heating and cooking. And he wanted to use this, um, uh, these twigs for in, in in, in, in the design of the project. So he wanted to make sure that I understand that uh, they were not selected for any decorative reasons, it has nothing to do with uh, decorative um, idea or material. So this was very functional and uh, it filters the light kind of magically. So there is a functional, this idea that function uh, is, is really important. Uh, this is the work of Neri and Hu. You know, I, I actually um, have a lot to, to go through. Um, but this, this project is important, Waterhouse in a boutique hotel in Shanghai. Um, um, well, the, the, what's unusual about this uh, architects, uh, Linda Neri and Rosanna Hu, is that they come from Chinese diaspora, unlike uh, many other, most other architects that we are looking at uh, today. Uh, so she, he is from Philippines, she from Taiwan, uh, both immigrated, uh, were educated in the US, established their practice in 2004. Uh, this project, um, um, in this project, the architects brought into focus the key theme of their practice. And this theme is of course now uh, becoming very popular globally. And this is romantic notion of nostalgia. So here there are some more um, images. Uh, 
So they had full freedom. In this case, they could demolish this existing building, but they decided to preserve it and add to it and uh, uh, really uh, fused uh, old and new. Uh, so there is this uh, beautiful play with such polar, polar notions as old and new, private and public comfort and discipline, coziness and starkness. Uh, so people tend to respond uh, well to materials that show their wear um, and uh, kind of beautiful pat pat patina of time and uh, a, a beacon for this uh, a beacon for this uh, line of thinking is of course David Chipperfield's Neu Neu Museum in Berlin uh, which was built uh, about one year before this project was built in 2009 and that really became an important reference for many Architects. So there are a few more slides of this project. So they they are very in kind of indicative of our time. And when I talk to the architects, uh, there is um, one quote which I really uh, like. They um, mentioned the quote of philosopher Svetlana Boim, uh, late philosopher Svetlana Boim, who said the 20th century began with utopia and ended with nostalgia. So it's a very interesting comment on what is going on particularly in architecture. So in a way we now embrace this notion of nostalgia and even find a lot of comfort in nostalgia. And this is another fragment of their work in Shanghai. Uh, it's a restaurant and um, it's a fascinating fragment of the preserved wall. Uh, which is put on display as a historical artifact um, at the museum. It, it is a beautiful way of uh, kind of flirting with history in such a way that uh, the border between history and modernity is more and more blurred. And this is another project uh, by at Atelier Deschhaus, uh, built several they built several major museums in Shanghai and just by doing that uh, they are really they can be called one of the most if not most visible independent practice architectural practice in China just because most other works are outside of major uh, cities and uh, so this is their lone museum it's one of the most uh, mm, uh, one of the most interesting projects built in modern China. It is kind of non-linear labyrinthian uh, interplay of uh, modular umbrella-like uh, units. Uh, so they said, there is a quote from our interview. They said the idea here is not to create an object, but to construct a path. Uh, the project is not about a new form, but how it is explored and experienced. And I just very, very quickly want to show you some references uh, from Western um, art and, and architecture that definitely serves as uh, some reference for the architects. A couple of other projects. What's interesting about the project on the right is that in China, you really have to deal with the context, which is constantly changing. You may be given a site which is entirely empty by the time you finish. Uh, it, there is a whole city around you. So how do you deal with that uh, uh, mind-boggling uh, change in context? So what they did on the right, it's a kind of community center. They surrounded, because they didn't know what was going to be around them, they surrounded the building by this uh, floating wall, concentrated on the indoor, on the inside condition, and then uh, created this kind of internally focused project. A very interesting way of dealing with the context. This is my Janssen Med Architects, founded in 2004, um, known internationally after uh, winning his absolute tower in 2006, just a couple of years after starting his practice. Uh, here you have uh, uh, Chao Yang, uh, Park Plaza in Beijing. It's located next to uh, a, a lake. And uh, 
and uh, so his buildings appear as if they were a part of a traditional brush and ink Chinese landscape paintings called uh, Shanshui. Uh, they depict mountains, rivers, waterfalls. And um, so he was saying that uh, many people think that my work is futuristic, but in fact, my work is very traditional. So he's looking for inspiration in uh, Chinese uh, traditional uh, paintings, but at the same time, if you look at his work, it is um, very kind of forward looking and uh, he needs to explain that it's driven by tradition. Uh, this is his uh, second building, uh, well, in this presentation, in uh, this is Harbin Opera House, uh, which is conceived as a mountain. What's interesting about this building, it has a path that runs through the building kind of independently from its internal program. So even when the building is closed, you can still uh, walk over it or you know, climb it uh, as a mountain. It's a very popular uh, building. You really have to make a special trip. It's in the middle of uh, almost nowhere. It's um, it's uh, it's and in a way on the outskirts of Harbin, but nevertheless, a lot of people make a special trip here, and they really uh, treat it as a kind of a very special, very special place. Shu um, Tian Tian, she's a GSD graduate, stands out as uh, one of the few female architects in China. She is the only one in the collection, uh, in the book, um, as, a, as a solo practitioner um, led by, by a woman, uh, she um, committed to building uh, very relevant public works in rural areas, particularly in small villages in Songyang County. Uh, there were quite a few exhibitions and uh, a book about her work. Uh, it's um, mainly done in, as I mentioned, in one region. Uh, it's a place of about 400 villages. She established very tight relations with the local um, authorities and um, collaborates with them on, on these projects. Um, she calls her, her her projects, architectural acupuncture, her um, in, in projects. One of them is um, here, Gallery of Pine Park Pavilion. And so note how architecture dissolves into the landscape, uh, becoming a kind of intr intrinsic part of, of the environment. And this is, of course, now, um, quite um, widespread um, feature in, in architecture, how, are, how buildings and landscape integrate one into another. This is another one of her projects. It's called Brown Sugar Factory. It's a demonstration kind of social space shown. Um, it shows an interesting interplay of traditional and modern materials. Uh, one of the reasons many local architects prefer to find work in the countryside is because uh, uh, so, so many uh, cities in China have become alike. This is what I mentioned before, uh, kind of homogeneous, uh, losing their identities, but each village presents um, a particular opportunity. So in this case, every village, in fact, in this region has its own uh, craft that they uh, celebrate. So in this particular case is brown sugar. Uh, there is another one, tofu. So it, again, it's a demonstration pavilion where uh, uh, locals can watch um, or even participate in, 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 in this particular product making. And um, they also work as social spaces and uh, there could be all kinds of performances there. Uh, so let me just go to another one. It's um, uh, 
um, in 2008, there was a major uh, Sichuan earthquake and uh, Li Jia Kun, uh, another architect of the first generation, um, initiated, <clears throat> initiated the use of brick or cement block reconstructed from the rubble uh, of the demolished building. So uh, all of these bricks uh, were actually created from the rubble of, uh, of that disastrous earthquake. So due to the use of this uh, technique, he's uh, ref referred to as architect of memory. So I, I thought it would be interesting to show this particular, not even the work that was built using these bricks, but the bricks themselves, the kind of building blocks of his work. And this is a very different project by the same architect, uh, Liu Jia Kun. Um, he did this um, block, res uh, it's a um, uh, kind of uh, village, um, it's, it's called West Village in, in Chengdu, and it's a whole block project, which is, um, I, I read that it's, uh, well, it's, um, it's a mixed use, I'm just not sure how much of it and if at all um, there is a residential component, but it seems like it makes sense that it's mostly residential, even though in the key uh, it's not mentioned. And this is 240 by 180 meter perimeter block, with building uh, blocks along three sides and one side closest to us. Um, those are ramps used by uh, people and bicycles. Th there is a stadium and all kinds of uh, activities in the middle. It's very public. It's open to the public. It's a very interesting kind of new type of uh, uh, building a block, a city block, a completely new formula that he seemed to um, invent. And this is uh, this are some of the details of, of that project. So in, in a way, it's an attempt to reverse the erosion of public spaces in Chinese cities. So uh, a very interesting project. And um, one of the most talked about buildings, uh, not just in China, but uh, around the world that was published in so many magazines recently, it's uh, very, uh, specific to, to the place, there is a certain um, incompleteness about this uh, overall image. Uh, uh, it's an art museum, uh, shows a break from a global recent attitude of kind of plopping uh, a made up form. Um, here, there is a family of forms, it's a, there is a dialogue, it's a kind of micro city that. Uh, um, come from from the place. This the form itself comes from the place. Uh, so during the construction, uh, there were archaeological ruins found, and so you can see how they were integrated into the form. And here you can see, um, you know, it's interesting to see where the ideas really originate uh, from, uh, because usually. Uh, our uh, students look for ideas in other buildings of, of the same type, uh, but this is a very different type, but uh, the form uh, gave the idea for, for this project. It's a kiln, it's a kiln and the museum, it's, um, it showcases the history of the, of the local kilns, the production of local kilns. And you can see the interior of the museum, how it um, explores that, that form. And that form was really uh, founded by uh, just discovering uh, local kilns in, in the area. And um, uh, Gondon uh, founded his Vector Architects in 2008. Uh, after working in America for such architects as Richard Meyer and Stephen Hall, uh, 
Uh, the architect is a great form giver. His work is both iconic and contextual. Uh, here, here is an adaptive, another adaptive reuse um, transformation of an abandoned sugar refinery. Uh, the ultimate design goal is um, um, of this intervention was to pursue a kind of atmospheric harmony. So uh, new and old uh, fuses together, and these are not additions in a way. Uh, he's building right over the historical remnants. And uh, so you can see how he brought the water into here and uh, everything is fused together. It's a, it's a, it's a very, um, it, it's a very um, um, striking and um, seductive, in not just this image, but the entire complex. Um, so there is no, there is kind of no competition between what's old and what's new. There is a, an ambiguity when I visited this, when I visited this complex, I talked to some of the people who were staying there. And when I told them that uh, at that point, when I was there, this complex was just one year old. And when I share this insight, uh, people just didn't believe me because to them, it looked and felt like it was always there. It's just part of, um, of the environment, this architecture. But in fact, uh, this was mainly new architecture. This is uh, actually, this is the last, this is the last slide before I will mention something at the very end. Um, so, um, it's interesting, uh, we talked already about nos nostalgia as a concept for some of the architects. And in this particular case, when I was at, um, at this uh, hotel, there is a theater uh, where they screen films. And uh, so when I went to see what they showed there, there was this film, Nostalgia by Andrei Tarkovsky. And um, after watching it for the first night, I went to see, I, I went to the theater the next night and I asked, so what are you showing tonight? And they said, Nostalgia. And I said, why? Well, didn't you show it yesterday? And it's 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 unbelievable. They actually said that they show nostalgia every night, and uh, and in a way, then I understood that showing that film and imagery in the film was a part of architecture and part of the experience. And there is such a strong connection. So here you see the final scene from the movie, and one of the um uh, one of the images of the of, of this hotel and so there is a kind of strong connection at least um at least um atmospherically so when i talked to the architect i asked him about this and he told me that in fact one of the clients uh is a film major and uh, that's his favorite film so that was even in the brief he actually a factor that in the design. So let me uh, finish with this um, um, observation of what unites uh, independent architects in China uh, who make up absolutely not the mainstream uh, for sure. It's a kind of uh, a subculture that exists in opposition to the mainstream architecture, which is produced by the local design institutes by uh, star architects. And um, what unites them is really uh, resistance. Uh, resistance, um, it is resistance to conventions, resistance to widespread demolition that I mentioned. 
um, of history, his historical layers, resistance to uh, standard mainstream construction, resistance to separating cities from the countryside, resistance to uh, separating architecture from nature, uh, and of course, uh, resistance to global architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vladimir. Great stuff. And uh, let me start the video. A lot of interesting projects that um, I haven't seen before. And uh, uh, some of my favorites, Atelier Deshaus and Toupay, I, I'm always blown away what they manage um, to do. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, maybe? And uh, can you can you go stop? Yeah, yeah, then we are big. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Very exciting uh, lecture. Um, you know, um, very scholarly. Thank you very much from the beginnings of Chinese architecture in the way we understand it and your extensive knowledge and thinking. Um, and um, so so I, I, I think if, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems there are probably three or four different phases uh, in Chinese architecture since the 1990s, since, of course, 1978, the opening of the country by Teng Xiaoping. But then it seems those three, four phases, the first one, only government and de design institutes pre-1995, uh, top-down driven, uh, communist party driven design institutes, usually in con con uh, connection with a university or um, a school of architecture and no private practice. Then this completely changes in phase two when architects establish their first private practices, the generation of pioneers, you call them, uh, 1995, to let's say 2010 maybe, and projects focus on cities, especially Shanghai, Beijing, as well as some interest in second tier cities, but limited, not too much. And a lot of foreign architects building um, uh, an immense amount of projects in China. And uh, every everybody is going there to get projects, uh, uh, you know, from the US, from Europe, um, from Australia and so on. And interestingly, Chinese graduates return from the US where they studied or the or Europe or the UK to China to found their practices. And many of them have been educated at Harvard, at USC, UCLA, at Columbia, at Bartlett, at AA school and so on. And they go back and they are the first pioneers. And then comes a different phase, phase three, I would think maybe since only 10 years ago, <laughs> 2010 around. And uh, there's almost no foreign architects involved anymore. There is a strong confidence of Chinese architects. We can do it ourselves. And also uh, government not interested allowing Chinese architects to be too much involved. And then there is a regional approach and a strong focus on the countryside away from the cities, you know, almost neglecting the cities. And I would say that now we have a fourth phase again today changing again <laughs> and i'm not sure what's next <laughs> but we see a uh, new patriotism uh we need we see um a political change uh we see of course the surveillance state from the pa party big brother uh social index and restructuring society uh in a way and i'm wondering what's the role architects will play in future and how far will they, will, will they be allowed to be politically involved or are they just stepping back and try to avoid any trouble with the Communist Party is going to be very interesting. I think the jury is still out there what that new face will look like, uh, but it seems like the face before that you showed so am amazing project has just come to an end and we see new frameworks, new conditions going morphing into something new and we don't quite know yet what's next. Would you would you agree with this observation? Well, this is uh, this is very good observation, but I would not. I don't see much of what is happening as far as new. Uh, what I see is uh, is that what is going on is refinement. New architects are coming into the field. Um, I don't see a lot of changes from what was really. Uh, the direction that was established in, let's say, 2010, 2015, uh, more names, more projects. Um, and, you know, the phases that you call them different phases, uh, yes, probably 
it's correct, but it's not because it's driven by any ideology architects, this particular architects, the independent ones, the typically small, some of them are not so small. Uh, Ma Janssen has a, a huge practice of, which is similar in a way to many uh, star architects. Uh, he has, I think about 130 people. So his presence in China is quite uh, major, um, but, these architects are looking for opportunities and there are very few opportunities in the cities. That's why they went into the countryside. And once they went to the countryside, how do you find work? You have to, um, you have to, um, you know, collaborate with local authorities. You have to find all of those connections and they are the ones who can give architects work. No matter, you cannot just initiate work, no matter, how you try, you, 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 can, um, you can let everybody know that you are interested, but the work is actually initiated by the local government, local authorities. And the reason that there are very few opportunities in cities is because uh, those projects are uh, taken by uh, local institutes or there are international competitions and foreign architects win those competitions and they come and they build uh, most lucrative uh, projects. There is something else. Um, you cannot practice entirely independently in, in China. So even though uh, they have this uh, independence that uh, started in mid 90s, um, you, can st you still cannot stamp your drawings. Mm. That's not allowed. So you have to collaborate with local institutes. Um, and um, local institutes, they are not very much interested in, in areas outside of big cities. They want to work on the biggest projects. And so if you, if you want to create something um, original and under radar of uh, um, the government uh, or uh, authorities in the cities, um, you you can do it in the countryside on a smaller scale. Also, when you work on a smaller scale, it's easier to experiment. In in one project, you can really experiment so many different things. It's um, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, in in one actually in one year, you can build a number of projects if they are small, and that really advances uh, these practices. They they become really. Um, they 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 get experience really uh, quickly because of the nature of of the work, hmm. and also you know what's interesting the difference between working in cities and working in the countryside is is quite major. In the countryside, in, in the cities, the the the, the buildings are packaged. Uh, they are dressed up in in the materials that are produced globally and they are just shipped and assembled 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 and in that's and so the work starts with a sketch of an architect that's the direction in the countryside is completely different you come into the countryside they're very limited resources uh, there are very few materials that uh, local craftsmen or builders are working with so the architects have to find that out they have to see what the locals are capable of doing. They can't just give them a sketch. This is never going to be implemented. So they see what materials are available, uh, what they can do, and that's how the project is driven. It's driven from the site. And this is very interesting. And this is how um, I think architects in the West are now, this is what they're trying to learn. Hmm. Because every project, in a way, every project becomes an experiment. Hmm. Uh, because you know what happens in for for many architects. I mean, seriously, it's it's quite interesting. If you analyze the career of so many architects that uh, become exemplary, it's the first project that they always come to. They write a book and then they take pages out of the book to build you know to write new and new stories to build new projects it's uh, 
now we are in a very reversed situation. Every project is an opportunity. And this is what the smaller practices discovered. Uh, they learn from the site quite literally. And, um, and they start anew. You know, I was just talking to, you know, this is related because I was talking to one architect in India and this is how they also work in China. Uh, I asked him if, uh, you know, when he works with different materials, does he accumulate those materials for the next project? You know, we all have, I mean, architects all have material library. And he was, no, absolutely not. Why? That means I, this will be a preconceived idea. I have a certain material, I have to use it. I am freeing myself from that situation. Every time I start from scratch, I look for new opportunities. So this is very interesting. This is what can be learned from this architects. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I mentioned that the focus is kind of shifting from one country to the next. Um, it's very different. I mean, they have done such a revolution. I don't expect them to do another one. Uh, I don't frankly see how they can, um, you know, how can they transition from this period to the next? Is it just gonna be a repetition and refinement? Um, how radical can be the next step? I think the radical next step is not gonna happen in China. That's my answer. Usually it goes from radical to mainstream and commercialization. And I think uh, the next radical steps will probably be somewhere else. But I, I agree with you, it's the site and it's also the process of construction. And it's so interesting that the countryside is the area of innovation and activity, not the city. <laughs> you know, because they say the city is done basically and it's commercial and you cannot do innovation in the city. You know, and it, those those buildings are not vernacular, as you explained so well, but they are contemporary regional works, and they are uh, fully contemporary, and they celebrate a new language formed uh, from the process of building of construction, and it's all about really getting getting it built. It's this is not making paper architecture, drawing drawings. This is all clearly focused on the production of getting the work uh, realized uh, and put it out there. Uh, very, very exciting uh, to discuss the, all those aspects. Are there any questions from some of our audience? I see Raul Merotra has joined us. Hey, Raul. <laughs> uh, anybody who wants to jump in here and make some comments? Hi, hey, Stefan. Hey, <laughs> good to see you. Thanks. Anybody who wants to make any comment, any, um, any question? Well, I mean, uh, sorry, I, Valdemir, nice to see you. Hello. Uh, no, thank How you. I enjoyed that very much. I'm sorry I was a bit late. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, I think just, Stefan, to pick up on your conversation and only, Valdemir, because you alluded to India, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I think the slight difference in India, and I'm curious to know if this is the situation in China, is in India, too, we have a stream of I think Stefan put it nicely and loosely, or maybe you said it, of this kind of modern regionalist kind, right? People who, I mean, the aesthetic is really an aesthetic of advanced modernism in a sense, uh, sometimes without any of its social agendas, uh, but it's very regional in Valdemar, what you described as the found materials. No, it's not a standardization and universalization of approach. Uh, and so now in India, that stream do, it does exist also. But then there are also extended models of practice that come from it all the way from ancient temples being built like they were built 5,000 years ago uh, to uh, architects sort of uh, actually working with local materials, but with imagery sometimes at edges on being like part of Naughty Land or Disneyland, but very robust in terms of using local materials. I wonder in China if there are other practices like that where which don't fit this lens of modernism as an aesthetic, because everything we saw that you showed us, very beautiful work, and I think your articulation, so it's, it's no criticism of anything, is just a question that, are there other streams of the production of architecture which is outside uh, the kind of 
modern aesthetic, albeit incredibly beautiful and rigorous and relevant that you showed us uh, that is being done in China that we can learn anything from? Well, what is interesting about China is that they seem, they seem to be ahead of us because they, uh, they have this double sensibility. You know, they are all educated in China, but they are, many of them are also educated in the West. So they have this double perspective. And uh, what they really have is, is uh, still, it's not pure modernism. There is a fusion. And uh, that's why I mentioned yeah. that there is a, always, there is a strong connection to, you know, they can talk about different um, features of different regions and different climates, mm. but you mm. can tell it's I, coming from yeah. one particular region with one history, which is uh, quite different. So they are in a way pulled in two different directions. So there is a modern um, aesthetics, but at the same time, very traditional materials. Uh, they try to explore uh, regional building techniques. And uh, and it's also it's always it's always a, a, a fusion. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, people like Yun Ho Chang, uh, he's more conceptually driven. Mm -hmm. uh, but many architects they really start with the materials mm -hmm. and uh, immediately from 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 very beginning it becomes. Would it be would it be correct to say, which is what struck me in the work? Um, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but I, I would just add. You know, it, it's much more tectonics driven than what we are seeing in many parts of the world. And that's why you're getting a variety because of the local materials. But the tectonic rigor seems to be very unique and very consistent, at least among the works you showed. Just a yeah. comment. Yeah. Yeah, it is consistent. I, you know, it, it is also consistent because I did a book and I want it to be consistent. Yes. <laughs> yes. And um you can actually find in, in the work, in the production of this architect, some inconsistencies as well. Yeah. And, um, and I try to filter that I see. because uh, I focused on this region. You know, if, I foc if we focus on many other regions around the world, we would not find this kind of consistency. We would not find this kind of common ground. But in China, um, you know, you can see it. Maybe uh, it was a little bit forced the way I focused on it. Uh, but you can see that all of these architects are going in one direction. It's a collective, you know, they can say what they want, but it's a collective project. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a totally collective project because they are asking, not only they ask, they're asking similar questions, Many of them have a very similar career path, which is unimaginable in so many other places. But in China, because they opened up recently, uh, many architects actually ex uh, went through very similar steps, you know, how they uh, were educated, how they even came into the profession. For many, it's because I interviewed them. So it's a very similar story. Uh, in the West, it, you would not have this consistency. Yeah. Even, even in India, in spite of the colonization, it's not as consistent. I mean, I think Mao's China, starting from that point, the way society was remade, it's only creating its diversity now. Uh, it's taken a generation or two for that to happen. And so that, that's an interesting observation. No, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. Thanks, thanks Stefan, too. Thank you. Thanks for um, participating, Raoul, and great to see you. And thank you so much, Vladimir. Wonderful lecture, uh, and it gives us a lot of thought for our studio. And uh, you are the first guest speaker in the this fall semester's public speaker program. I just want to remind everybody, Tuesday, we have, uh, on the 18th of October, we have Professor Michael Hensel from TU Vienna. And on Friday, 21st of October, we have uh, leadership from Perkinsville in Los Angeles that are leading all research in Perkinsville, US nationwide. Uh, so it should be interesting. And um, please um, um, watch that space, come back, tune in, and uh, let's put our hands together for Vladimir. Thanks, Vladimir.
for your um, effort also to come online and I wish you all a wonderful uh, weekend and great to see you all and hope to catch up very soon. Thank you. And thank you for including me with yeah. the link. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Right. And the students stay on a little bit longer, please. <laughs> and uh, we have now a five minute break um, or let's make it seven minutes. And then we start with the presentations today of precedent analysis presentations, where we hopefully see a lot of more elegant, beautiful buildings uh, with plan section and elevation. And if everything's all right, we see again, now it's 237, let's make that 245. And let's be back at 245. And there's no particular sequence. Um, how we can uh, present, uh, we can we can make it up as we go. Okay, fantastic. So 2.45, time for making a quick coffee, and I see you in seven minutes.
Okay, now it is 2.45. <clears throat> I hope over the next one and a half, two hours to see 10 students, four projects, 40 projects. <laughs> Could be fun, each two minutes. And uh, I know Cindy can't make it, she's at a doctor. So uh, maybe we uh, start, um, who, wants to, who wants to be first? <laughs> Let me put it that way. I can go first. Okay, Gazal, you have um, Weissenhof, Siedlung, two houses by Corpus DA, and Cesc Pompeo in Berlina Bobardi, right? Yes. And what else? And I can show you all in the presentation. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So my uh, first person in the study was two houses at Wiesenhof. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the words right. <laughs> you have to excuse me. And it was by Le Corbusier and Pierre Janner. Uh, 